Hi, everyone. Welcome to the AMA Atlanta virtual event, Who Stole the Cookies? Connecting the Customers in a Cookie-less World. My name is Courtney Tierney, and I am a volunteer with the AMA on the Sponsorship Committee. So just to start us off today, we first want to thank our sponsors. So our diamond sponsor, Nebo, our bronze sponsors here, the Goway Group, Hey Orca, and Georgia Specific, our event sponsors, and specifically Lucky, who's our event sponsor today, our higher education sponsor, Mercer College, and our scholarship program sponsor, Google. For any sponsorship information, please contact Guy Powell, and we have his um, email address here. Also just wanna make you all aware our next virtual event, uh, which is free and online Thursday, April 15th is an AMA Collegiate Young Professionals virtual mixer and job fair. So um, if you have any questions, um, please reach out to the website. We will have this posted soon. So keep an eye out. And lastly, I just wanna introduce our event sponsor. Our program is sponsored, like I said today, by Lucky and Company. Lucky is a marketing and solutions firm with more than 100 employees in their Atlanta and Birmingham offices. Moderating the panel will be Lucky's president, John Gardner. John is a longtime champion of data-driven marketing and he spent his career bringing the science of data and the art of marketing together for clients. We're really excited to bring together a group of digital marketers who are interested in the upcoming changes to cookies and IDs created to protect user privacy. We first need to understand what's changing, when and how it will impact all of us. We've got a great panel here today to discuss this hot topic. I'll let John further introduce the topic and our panelists. So get ready, it's gonna be a great discussion. Outstanding, thank you, uh, Courtney. I really appreciate that. And as we uh, switch presentation modes, uh, I've got a uh, an amazing uh, crew to uh, to bring to you today. So, uh, who stole our cookies? Let's uh, let's go dive right in with the uh, cookie monster attitude. Let uh, me say this: uh, at any point in time, uh, ask us questions. There is a Q&A feature uh, that we would prefer you utilize um, that is on the top or bottom, but it says Q&A. There is a chat feature as well, uh, but uh, that is mainly to discuss what is occurring here. So Q&A as uh, much as you want, uh, but we've got a locked and loaded uh, pack of questions for you today. Um, so as I uh, get things going, I wanted to Oops, sorry, level set a little bit. Ah, nothing like uh, starting at the end. So my panel, amazing crew. Uh, I'm very excited to say that uh, I, I know professionally all of these folks and can attest to their brilliance. Uh, uh, start with Alan McGee, who's, who runs all the uh, digital marketing technology at churches. Uh, Alan is really a visionary when it comes to put, putting in this integration of technology analytics into play. Um, so, Alan, you want to give us two seconds and then we'll move on. Thanks, John. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Alan McGee, um, manage all things consumer facing that are digital for Church's Chicken. I've been there about two and a half years. And this topic is something that we've been talking about really since the turn of the year. So I was excited when I got the call to, uh, to join this group. Outstanding. And uh, I think, uh, Alan, you'll love here and his perspective, not just from churches, but his background as well with Intercontinental Hotels uh, and Moe's. Um, I saw also from the Lucky team, uh, a true visionary when it comes to the marketing technology side is Tunde, Tunde Noibi. Uh, Tunde has an amazing background in most major uh, marketing automation technology platforms, including Marketo and, and Salesforce, and he leads our vision here at Lucky. So Tunde, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, John. I'm Tunde Noibi. I'm lucky for about two years. Uh, for the past two years, I've been on a journey of trying to figure out how to get to the point of really, really focus on customer success and experiences using, you know, the right data. Um, happy to be here. Um, let's go. All right. Uh, in the in the middle, bottom center uh, is Karen Reardon. Karen is, uh, again, a visionary when it comes to the leadership on destination marketing. 
Uh, we met uh, Karen when she ran the Williamsburg uh, Convention Visitors Bureau, Chamber of Commerce, and all of this great background. But one of the things I love about Karen, she was also with Arnold. Uh, so she understands the challenges that us as uh, on the partner delivery side agency have. Uh, recently, she took over at Myrtle Beach right when COVID was hitting. Uh, and I've, I've told Karen is that she's going to be responsible for like Tune Day, giving us the technology aspects of what's going to happen. I'm just kidding a little bit, Karen. So if you want to give us a, a hello. Very funny, John. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Bearden. As John said, uh, I spent most of my career on the agency side, uh, building brands for so many great clients and have had the distinct pleasure in the last 20 years to really focus my career in travel and tourism, which is a passion of mine. So um, I love being on the CBB side now. And um, again, very, very excited to be part of the panel today and share my insight, um, you know, from the from the DMO perspective, so to speak today. Great. Uh, last and certainly not least is Andrea Trailer from Regions Bank, uh, located over in Birmingham. Uh, she is responsible for their digital marketing strategy. Uh, we've uh, been working with Andrea for a while on, on this very topic. So very excited to see her expertise because uh, definitely I think uh, this panel is going to be impacted by this, but certainly uh, Andrea is in the middle of it. So Andrea, you want to uh, introduce yourself? Yes, thanks, John. Hi, I'm Andrea Trailer. I'm very excited to be here and talk about this topic. We've been talking about this topic for over a year at this point in time, maybe kind of leading the forefront of it as we saw that the industry is starting to change. Um, I really focus a lot on platform logistics within our media team, so our MarTech ad tech solutions within that group, which will greatly be impacted by the change in the cookie, as well as some demand generation and our own strategy for digital. So a lot of things that all lead into the use of the cookie. Looking forward to talking with everyone. Outstanding. So thank you. I think uh, this panel is uh, going to bring a lot to to bear. So let me uh, just uh, gratuitous uh, propaganda about Lucky. I appreciate uh, Courtney uh, introducing us, but we've got a, uh, we'll call it a, a cookie list survey that we'd love to see how you guys are preparing for this. Uh, we've dropped a QR code there, so snap it with your phone. I've also included it on a couple of subsequent slides, so don't worry if you don't get it. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll send you some, uh, some tips based on this panel uh, directly back to you if you are interested. So let's start with some standard definitions. And, and the assumption is, is everybody on this call has some indication of what's happening, but we always like to level set when we uh, start a process like this. So the first one is IDFA. is It's an identifier that Apple is specific to the Apple in-app tracking uh, and Apple has declared that privacy is a user right and have really been a, a, a front end proponent of privacy. And we've all heard of walled gardens or most of us have. Um, and it's that idea is you can't have access to that shared data inside that walled garden. Google, Amazon and Facebook, which uh, these four logos happen to be probably the dominant players. Uh, I, I'm guessing 80 to 90% of all control of our what we want, uh, the data we want, they control. So uh, we have to understand how the, both the IDFA changes in the walled garden constraints will affect us. You know, a, a cookie, basic, uh, it's been around a long time. And uh, basically this allows us to, uh, as a marketer, to drop some uh, information and, and follow you across the, the hinterlands of this thing called the web. And uh, the design, certainly from a user perspective, as marketers, we say we're going to improve the customer experience. Uh, but from a user perspective, I think sometimes we get uh, the boo factor of how do they know I was just on J. Crew and why is this popping up? So uh, we're going to talk about that. And then first and third party, you know, first party data and a cookie is that when you visit a website, that, that company uh, that website owns that user visit and not an advertiser, whereas a third party cook cookie has a more ubiquitous uh, effect in marketing. That's the, what we use for retargeting and ad serving. So uh, a little benchmark. So as we were preparing for this and as I was talking with the panel is this tension that we are faced is uh, between the consumers and brands is consumers will give up data 
uh, and allow tracking if there, we create relevance. And that relevance can't be invasive. It, it has to be, you know me and you are benefiting my life. Whereas brands, we are very interested in transaction. Uh, and the more data we have, uh, the better we can create that relevance, but at the same time, the better we can drive demand. And so this tension in the center on privacy is what we want to uh, bring about today. So this has been a long journey and uh, I, I get a, give a lot of credit to uh, a, a very talented young lady on my team, Andy Harvey, who helped uh, me articulate this, this webinar in this sense of Basically, what she said to me is she said, John, you got a lot of gray hair. And back when you were my age, email was important. And she said, guess what? It's important again. And so this journey from the being able to own an email back in the 90s, all the way through the wild, wild west of, uh, of data everywhere, coming back to control is what we're going to talk about today. So as we start this preparation and this thought, it's Owning our data is the key to surviving these changes. It's, it's how can we as either brands or marketers on behalf of brands ensure that we have strategies to own the data. And so as this we last slide as we get going is the five areas that we're going to talk about today is how do we understand the new five areas of influences being consumer centric, taking an omni channel approach to everything we're doing, even with less data or at least overt data. Um, and then content strategy, user experience and content marketing. So with that, I'm going to stop my share and we're gonna dive right in. So Tunde, I'm gonna start with you. Um, from a technical perspective, how, how are, what are you recommending uh, that we take into account? Are we talking about a whole new technical re-architecture uh, or can we use what we have and how do things like blockchain and AI play into this new world for us? On mute. First, I would say, don't go build yet, right? Don't buy a new tool, don't buy a new platform, go back and do a thorough audit of your current technical stack first. Right, I look at your websites, your CRM integrations, look at your mobile apps if you have one, look at your, um, your offline experiences also, right? And when you do that, look at the user experience, but look deeper into the actual technical touch points. So for example, yes, I may have gotten the email from you, but how did I get the email, right? Was it complying to the new CCPA laws, right? Uh, when I got the website, um, sign up form was it compliant so go through the journey from a technical perspective across the entire UX experience then assess that and then figure out what do I have in front of me so I would just say don't go build or buy a new platform first assess your solutions and then figure out where the gaps are a lot of times you see that you probably have too many platforms in front of you doing the exact same thing for example you may say I have a DMP either use Oracle, Blue Kai, or Salesforce Crux, or Adobe's Audit Manager. And those really use third-party cookies to identify you. Do you need that? Or do you need a CDP or a hybrid, right? So I always first say assess first um, what you need and map the actual customer journey. Then at the same time, when it comes to blockchain, right? So first party data is gonna become a lot more important as we know, right? So privacy, customer experiences, and a customer and consumer really owning their data. So I will say this, for the future, explore blockchain. See what it means for your business and for your organization and for your brand. Explore how blockchain could maybe help you create that true customer privacy over time. Will it happen tomorrow? Probably not but I would encourage everybody to use blockchain as initial researching and dig it into it and how it can help you overcome those future, you know, privacy challenges. Outstanding. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna come uh, to Alan next. Um, so Alan and then Andrea coming to you after Alan is, you guys have both been in the, the, the meat of this as, as technical marketers. What are you doing to prepare and what uh, can advice can you give the rest of us uh, to, uh, not be afraid or to be very afraid? <laughs> Good question. Uh, I'll say we 
it's nothing to be afraid of, right? The, our fate is in our own hands as marketers here. Uh, and it's also a good opportunity for us to reset in a lot of areas. So a, a lot of us are at brands or in organizations where there might be some, some poor data infrastructure or might be some areas that you need to reset. And so this is giving us an opportunity to do some level setting in there. For instance, at churches, uh, we have a mobile app, we have an email platform. They were two vastly different databases when I came in a couple years ago, but also we didn't, we didn't have any transaction data. We didn't have any first party data. And so that was a big part of our journey was how do we get first party data? And we spent most of last year standing up a customer database platform to be able to then actually pull that in and have a first party data platform that we can use for, for one CRM, but the other for paid media, whether it's targeting, whether it's suppression, also just understanding that the impact of it. So we're not fully relying on third parties for attribution. Uh, so I'd say, again, like what Tundi said, you know, look and assess at what you have. And there might be some areas that, that need a reset. There might be some areas that just need a little enhancement. You might have really good data. Um, and so that's the starting point. Uh, and, and then just begin starting to have this conversation. If you haven't been having this conversation, now is the time to start having it with your internal stakeholders, your agencies, your media partners, and just bring it top of mind because uh, it's gonna be here before we know it. And it's something that it's gonna take many steps to get to as it evolves almost on the weekly of what's going on in this space. Great. Andrea, what, uh, when you think of what, uh, picking up on what Tunde and Alan have said, uh, how would you apply this to what you're doing at Regions? Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more with both Alan and Tunde. Reassess your tech stack, take a deep look. That's kind of what we're in the process of doing right now after we've gotten a better understanding but don't do anything right away. Be flexible because we are still learning. It is still evolving. It is still changing. As you saw, Google made the announcement last week that they're not going to allow the, the, the tracking within their platform. And so, um, you know, that could change a tool that you may have been looking at using to now, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to go heavier into more of the walled garden? Um, so that is something I definitely recommend. And it is also, again, good time to streamline a lot of the things that you have. Um, you know, we as regions alone do have platforms that do duplicative types of things. Um, a lot of places have best-in-class solutions, and then they have other elements, and so sometimes you end up with a lot of pieces that overlap. Find your need space, find the things that are the strongest to what you're trying to accomplish, but make sure it's based on needs, and you're not just getting a tool because it's another tool. Make sure it's meeting your needs and what, what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to be able to understand these customers. As a financial institute, we're very lucky. We have a lot of first party data, right? Um, that is a very heavy game that we play today. And I think, although we're not perfect, we do it fairly well. Um, we do a lot of own. Um, so people we know within our site, how to manage for our authenticated spaces. We use it for suppression. A lot of things that Alan spoke about, I think our biggest focus is on how do we prospect, right? And so understanding that need of prospecting of customers for us, um, is going to be really big. And without that cookie, that does change our tech stack. We do use Adobe Audience Manager at Regions as a DMP, and it is built off of cookies, right? So how do we evolve that to help us um, find those customers that we're looking to get, which will then again, re rely a lot on that first party data because you know you can do lookalikes and stuff. But um, I think the industry as a whole is gonna take a step back and, and be a little bit more um, contextual data and not necessarily refined data so that your targeting may take a step back to, to how you did it, but that leaves a great opportunity to look at your creative. Like our creative agency was lucky um, for digital banking or digital marketing is, is a great opportunity um, to help us get to the point where we are bringing people back to our site to get that first party data and enrich it even more. Great. So Karen, I'm, I'm gonna to come to you and I'm not going to ask you uh, uh, about a DMP or a data lake or all that really cool stuff. Um, but I will ask you, because you have a unique perspective is you manage a whole team and a, a reliant on your team being able to grasp this. So my question to you, since this is not your day job, uh, but cookies are critical right now, the way you, Myrtle Beach uh, tries to create attribution and tries to remarket. So what advice or what, how are you handling that? Uh, and any um, 
ways in which questions you're asking to your team that we could leverage. Sure, thanks. Um, you, you're right. I mean, and, and our situation is, is even a little bit more different in that we're, you know, the tourism bureau. So we have the responsibility and the pressure to be creating desire and demand for an entire geography. Um, we don't, we own our brand, but we don't own the customer. We never have, right? Um, our goal is to get someone to visit MyrtleBeach.com and to get them off visit MyrtleBeach.com as quickly as possible onto someone else's site in our, in our ecosystem so that our CBB partners um, can book that stay or book that attraction ticket um, or get a reservation to their restaurant or to their golf course. So um, I think, you know, one thing that COVID has sort of taught us is, as, as all the speakers have said, is um, nothing stays the same, right? Nothing is static and we have to constantly be proactive in our planning. So I think that's my message uh, to this group and to my team. Um, our model is such that we are a very lean and mean marketing team. As you know, John, we rely very heavily on our agency partners. They are the extension of, of what we do. Um, we literally have six people in our marketing department um, and, and yet a huge budget and um, a lot of demand to, to create in order to have 20 million visitors come to see us every year. So, um, you know, it really is about um, looking at some of those things too, that I'm going to age myself as well, that, um, you know, were the basic building blocks of, of, of this business when I joined, um, you know, the advertising and marketing world. Um, I had the good fortune of starting in a direct marketing agency and um, at the time was groaning about it and wanted to, you know, work on the next sexy Nike, just do it campaign. But um, what's been really great about that is, again, going back to CRM, going back to email, going back to our website. Um, right now, we also have a lot of brand affinity co-op programs that we do, and we're constantly collecting new email uh, addresses because of that, but we probably haven't been putting that to as maximum of use um, because we were, frankly, so spoiled and taking advantage of everything that we had in, in a cookie world. So I think that it's going to mean for us um, being proactive, but also going back to some of those building blocks and looking at things that are in our own um, you know, that we control now that our own assets um, and uh, using some of them um, more strategically and not taking them for granted anymore. So that, that's kind of how I'm thinking about it at a, at a, at a high level, 50,000 foot level. That's uh, outstanding. So Alan, you have a unique perspective having uh, been at Intercontinental Hotels and understanding the travel side, but now in the QSR space. So as you think about how customers are going to be affected um, how do we enhance the customer experience uh, when we can't create it as direct relevance without them knowing? Yeah, I, th I think that it, it comes down to and, and the contextual nature of it. And, and Andrea talked about this a little bit before is um, you know, how you bring that to life creatively, whether it's um, a lot of A-B testing in your creative, it's around um, really getting smart in, in your messaging. Uh, I still think a lot of us out here in the industry from the brand side are still very much in a batch and blast uh, creative approach and overall marketing strategy. And the more that we can try to shift from kind of one to all to, to one to few, uh, even if it's, hey, this is the context and this is the segment that I'm going after, even though it's probably gonna be targeted vastly different, but I'm doing very specific creative, different call to actions to it. Maybe there's different targeting parameters around the how, what, when, and where. That's the stuff that gets closer to that personalization that then does lead to more attribution. Uh, and, and for us in the restaurant industry, you know, it's very similar to Karen. Um, you know, my goal is to drive them through uh, to a landing page, to a restaurant location page, get them the information that they need then get them to a restaurant. You know, I, I want them to be clicking on directions, showing up in a drive-through or placing a delivery order at a restaurant. And so it's how fast can I get them through the funnel to get there? And then, but the hardest part, like you're saying, is that acquisition side of how do I, how do I target them at the right time with something that's personal and relevant and creative enough to get them to kind of jump over that hurdle. And then we start to move into how do we make them loyal? So um, in a roundabout way, that's a lot of what we're talking about is kind of the both sides of it, the technical side, and also just really that brand marketing side of a rethink about how we've been doing stuff. That's, that's great. So Andre, I'm going to pick up on Alan. 
Uh, so Alan has a very quick uh, top of the funnel, the bottom of the funnel. Uh, you know, I can I can target and go to churches uh, in the next hour. Where with in banking and at regions, uh, I don't need a checking account every uh, every day, every month. But I have products and services that I need to create awareness for. So how does a, that differential and and lifetime impact? Um, of products and services and solutions from regions, how can we turn this cookie-less world into a positive or not become just crippled by it? Good question. Definitely um, one that we're still trying to um, figure out, but um, things that we can do is definitely, again, going back to the con contextual um, the interactiveness within the creative that is developed for that to then bring them back to the site where that we can get to know them a little bit better. Um, there's this uh, new kind of terminology that I've learned about recently. Um, others may know it more, but it's zero party data, mm -hmm. um, which I think is going to be a key thing where you can then get the customer to basically progressive profiling in a way of a customer coming in, or you can get them to give you snippets of information. Again, you don't want to give a customer or a prospect um, a lengthy uh, questionnaire to uh, turn around and respond. They'll give you snippets of data as relevant as they feel to help you, um, to kind of opt in to help you give them a better experience. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity um, within, the, within that aspect of getting them back to where your first party data and then you can get information and then and build that kind of prospecting base, mm -hmm. but also the ability to capture um, that information so that you can then reach out to them in the other avenues, right? So that omni-channel approach more. So we're very heavy on our own properties who come in, anything we know about you that we can use. Um, we have authenticated spaces, so it kind of tells us who you are. We can put things into the first party cookie, because as we know, the first party cookie will remain, as you, you discussed, um, and use that information to bring that personalization and then help show them that the, the need space or how we can differentiate this information to the customer to make them consider regions as, as a opportunity to either bring their banking relationship or enhance the relationship they already have with us today. That's okay. So Tunde, I'm coming to you and picking up on uh, Alan and Andrea. Uh, you know, obviously, technology is at a backbone, and we go. Alan mentioned going from uh, one to all, one to one to few, and hopefully we got to get to one to one. So, what are the steps from a, a technology perspective to support the marketers? I think the step is is to have enough star first. I mean, I think you have to. Think about your own channels, right? Your website, your social, um, and your email, right? And we all kind of forgot about the whole integrated experience between the website, email, and social. So if I get email, an email today with a certain content and creative, let that follow through in social, follow through in the website, right? Be more personalized. So if you think about the scripting you can do, um, the really cool thing you do with your own websites. You can be very targeted, very personalized, but the key thing is the North Star of having an integrated experience from web to email to social and then back to your internal CRM and customer service that your, your customer service people actually deliver to your consumers, right? So that's the important thing um, is using the right tools and place to do that. So like, for example, a website, if I get an email today and saying, hey, welcome today to Church's Chicken, right? Now I live in Suwannee, that website should then take me to a page. I should say, oh, by the way, you're in Swanee. Here's your locations. Um, so keep that integrated flow um, at the forefront and get your developers and engineers to tackle that problem first to create that experience. So Karen, um, when you listen to uh, kind of these great experts, and I know you'd love to have all, all the <laughs> three of them on your team uh, solutioning this, is there anything that as, as you listen or have prepped for this that would change the way you uh, challenge the way your teams work across media, content, creative, and technology, or the way your agency teams would work together? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I mean, that's something we've been looking at already. Uh, it, it's just, uh, you know, again, it, it sounds kind of a little bit back to the future. I mean, these are things that we were doing before we had uh, some of the tools that we've been using in 2019, 2020, and 2021, um, but it is going back and, and really tightly 
um, putting those teams together um, so that it's an end-to-end -end thought process um, for the whole customer journey. And really, as Tunde was just saying, just really mapping it all out and really thinking about um, those connections and those interconnections. Um, I think, again, um, we, we get very siloed. Um, it's very easy for us to just fall into, well, you know, Firm A is doing this and Firm B is doing this, the internal team's doing that um, and, and not connecting those dots. So um, I know from my perspective in thinking about this and talking to our teams and, and we can include our agencies as part of that team, um, it, it, it is kind of re resetting the button and thinking this through. And as I said before, not taking um, some assets like our website in particular for granted. Um, I would predict that there are going to be a lot of marketers across the US and across the world that are going to be in investing uh, quite a bit of money in their website development and redevelopment and redesign um, and rethinking <laughs> next year. So honestly, yeah, I mean, really, uh, it, it, it right, makes a lot of sense. And if, and if you're not thinking that way, that's something that you should start thinking about and budgeting for because it's going to be necessary, just like, again, email marketing, as we said, our database um, you know, we, we've, we've cried for years about how we collect and, and, and um, manage these enormous databases, but, you know, how closely are we looking at that? How well are we really using um, all of the information that we have in our databases? So I, I think there's going to be a push to go back to some of those things that we already own and do them better. Do them oh, better. That's great. So, Alan, I'm coming to you. This kind of similar question is, as you challenge your internal and agency teams, how do you see you know, media content technology and analytics having to work more closely or, or do that? I think very closely. And in the past, they've, they've worked together, but there's still been a little bit siloed. And so now we've got our technology partners, our data partners, our digital agency, our media agency, they're all having the same conversations and they're all talking and we're trying to figure this thing out together. And that's kind of actually the cool part about this is, you know, it's, it's level set no matter if you're, you know, if you're Karen, if you're Andrea, if you're me, you know, whatever brand is, everyone's on the same level playing field. So everyone's trying to solve this. And yeah. uh, most agencies and partners want to dig in and figure out some solution. So um, everyone's kind of playing, you know, very nicely in the sandbox and everyone wants to figure out a winning strategy coming out of this. And so, um, so yeah, it's, it's been great to see collaboration from all of our partners and trying to pull their different thinking and their, their different approaches and saying, how do we do this? Here's one approach versus another. This is what we should be thinking about testing and when, how, and where this year to get us ready. Um, so yeah, it, it's been encouraging. I, I love this feeling. It's one of the few times where we actually get to level set mm -hmm. as a marketer across to everybody, especially churches as a, as a, a mid-sized competitor with some of our, our big competition who has more dollars and more resources. And, and hey, we're, we're level setting with them now. That's, that's great. So let me, uh, Andrea, Andrea, I'm coming to you next, but I want to encourage everybody uh, to ask questions uh, through the Q&A button on the, the Zoom link. Uh, we've got a couple queued up that I will go to uh, next, but Andrea, I want to ask you the same thing uh, of integration across uh, within the departments at, at regions, because regions of, of all of the folks on this panel is by far has the most siloed departments but you also have the most agency partners. So what are you seeing and, and how, how was, are you trying to herd the cats? I think that's an ongoing struggle that we, we have regularly of herding cats um, because everyone has great ideas and they want to bring their great ideas to life. But it's, it's making sure that we all vet the great ideas together and make sure that it is something that can be implemented and, and really reaches the goal. So we do have an agency integration team that does work together at regions. It brings all of our agency partners together. And in these, the intent is to make sure that they're talking about these types of things in addition to how we're going to move and, and how, how we're going to reach that common goal, right? Um, regions' goal with our agency partners is how do we deepen our relationships and how do we bring new customers, right, to the bank? Um, and so it is, it's a task that we can't take on by ourselves. We are a bit of a, a smaller marketing team compared to some. And we do have, as you said, a, a heavy reliance on our agency partners. So we bring together our EM, our, our EMDM, our digital um, tech, um, creative, as well as our, you know, you guys are our, our creative team for both digital and um, brand. 
And then we also bring in our media agencies and, and we all rely on them to work cohesively together to get us to where we need to go um, as a common goal. Um, one thing I, I, I will say is, is technology is ever changing and, and we are running several tests right now. Um, as I spoke earlier, prospecting is, is a big thing for us, right? Um, and how do you do this in a cookie-less environment when you are very dependent on the cookie to be able to find those people that you're targeting? And so uh, within our agency, we are running several tests right now with um, people like Mercury or Wonderman Thompson um, to try and find that one-to-one -one so that it makes the media that we're buying smarter. It makes us understand whom we're talking to so we can have that more personalized conversation with them and the need space to help get them into the bank. Um, and, and engage with those. So that, that is a tool and a tactic that we're trying to, to figure out how to how do we do that with that cookie and, and how do we make the dollars go smarter and trying to, to get to those customers um, that are similar to the customers that you know Regions wants to keep and obviously maintain and deepen those relationships. So how do we find those within the targeting constraints that we will be facing without without the cookie going forward? Okay. Um... What I uh, want to ask, or what I want to go to now is some panel questions, um, is from Guy Powell, uh, who uh, I think leads this, our group here, is very interesting. He said, can we give, what can we expect the impact of Cookless World to be on marketing ROI for digital channels? Um, Tunde, why don't you start and then we'll go ar around the room. I think the impact will be um, well received. I feel like when you get more targeted um, to your customer base or consumer based, you will see an increased ROI on your on your marketing spend compared to having to the bat and blast everybody. Um, I think when you're more targeted, uh, you will get a higher ROI back on that customer um, spending it. So, Alan, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I think in the long run, um, more targeted will give us a better ROI. I think we are going to see a dip, whether it comes first quarter, you know, first six months of, of next year, as a lot of stuff kind of gets sorted out and we're probably going to see some lower performance and that's something to, to level set in. And I'm kind of a realist and it's like, hey, we're probably going to see a dip for a little while, and then we're going to figure some stuff out, and then it's going to get back to being really efficient, especially as the whole industry goes through it together. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's that's my prediction. But I think we'll get back to really um, high efficiency pretty quickly. Great. Karen, um, I know uh, media attribution mm -hmm. and uh, ROI is critical for what you do. Do you Have you gotten a sense of how that will affect how you measure things, or are you still yeah. trying to figure it out? I tend to agree with Alan. I, I think we're going to have some heartburn uh, initially in the tourism industry. I think that, uh, and again, a lot of that is because of the interrelationship between ourselves and our CVB partners. Um, right now, they expect so much from us um, and they are so used to um, being able to pinpoint exactly um, what we're doing and what we're delivering for them. And I think as we go through this level set, uh, you know, it's going to be about managing some of their expectations. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, the, the road we've been on already um, last year through COVID and this year has been um, much more focused on efficiency and on lifetime value and on length of stay and other tourism business metrics um, and not as much on some of the marketing metrics in the past that they may have been consumed mm -hmm. um, with. So I think that's important. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, so it, it is going to be a shift, but I, I tend to think that initially um, there's going to be some folks that think that the sky is falling um, mm -hmm. and we're going to have, we're going to have to manage through that. We're going to have to set expectations. All right. Andrea, what do you uh, think as it relates to uh, attribution and measurement? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with, with the group here, especially within the digital environment space, because you're going to have a hard time um, being able to be as efficient because transferring that data between cross platforms is going to be a lot more challenging without the, the cookie being present. Um, and, and in addition, um, the more premium platforms in the direct buying, potentially your costs for those premium placements and stuff in those channels for the, for the areas that you're looking to, to talk to, I could see that the cost becoming a little bit more expensive. So that's going to have an impact. And so you're going to see that potentially happen. But with the hopes that what Tunde had to say is it's going to be 
smarter. It's going to be more refined and that you will have um, better response because you're also respecting the privacy. This is what the customers are saying they want. And so by doing this, you hopefully will get the engagement that you're looking for. But I do see that we will take potentially a step back, maybe looking at last click attribution, potentially, you know, going reverting back to that. Um, but I think it will level set, set itself out after a while and we get into a more stable place. So, so Tunde, coming uh, back to you a little bit on data integration is, uh, you know, back in back in the again the day, I sound like uh, walking uphill both ways to school in the snow. Um, but we relied very heavily on almost manual data association with point of sale data and creating proxies. So, is it is there a way technically that we can not make that process so manual, uh, quasi manual? Uh, or are, they, are there solutions out there that can um, get us away from just, as Andrea was talking, last click attribution? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, what I consider next generation platforms are building with the API first mindset. So allow you to have better integrations with different platforms and systems so you don't have to do any manual um, data inputs or manipulation. Um, so I always say, you know, find a tool that actually has a very good platform API integration that you can use and leverage across different technologies. And that would reduce the need for manual. But again, there's still a chance where you may need to do some manual stuff at the beginning. Um, and I would say, you know, data itself is always an ongoing evaluation, right? So you may feel like, hey, I got good data today, and next month, not so good. So I would say constantly do the evaluation um, with the right integrations to your systems and then find a way to just slowly build a unified customer view. It won't happen overnight, but slowly find a way to build that out with your data sets you have. So uh, this is uh, an interesting question, Paul Carpenter uh, asked it, and I think it's, it's, it is more, I think, uh, taking the spirit of data is, and it was directed at Alan, but I think it, it also applies, to Karen, to you, is the question was, that, you know, the the, with COVID, there's been an intersection of the, the third-party delivery services actually owning the data. Um, and uh, they have, you know, I, literally before this, I, I had DoorJest bringing me Chick-fil-A, uh, and they own my information. Is there anything you and other brands can do to get that, um, or is it just going to be relying on retail outlets for distribution? So uh, start with you, Alan, and Karen, I'll follow up with you. I love Paul. He always asks really good questions. Like, <laughs> uh, and, and this is something that we talk about in the restaurant industry all the time in different round tables across whether small, large brands. Um, but the delivery partners are another walled garden. I mean, they're another Google or Facebook for us where they own that customer relationship, that data, um, but they drive a ton of, uh, you know, a ton of revenue in there. And so I'd say there's, there's two tactics that we really are taking up how to, how to get that data, how to bring it in. And one is a lot of restaurant brands are trying to move towards their own branded delivery. So we own the front end of the delivery transaction and then farm it out to the delivery drivers to go take the order. And you see that in a lot of brands today. Um, and that's probably the big shift in the industry because everyone wants that data. We wanna know, are you a order ahead and pick up? Are you a drive-through or are you a delivery customer? Or do you have different occasions for each of those? I'd say that's one. And the other part is just really a rethink from a restaurant marketer's perspective in, in shifting to channel marketing. And it's not a lot about how, um, how we've marketed historically. We have, really haven't thought about channels, but the delivery partners really opened this up and they have their own media, which I will say is, um, if you ever see any of these media rates and to get advertising inside of DoorDash or Uber, uh, it will shock you. <laughs> how much it costs to, to, <laughs> to get a banner placement in there, even if it's targeted. Um, and so, you know, they're opening themselves up as a, as really a, another media outlet and, a, and a, a CRM addition. And so it's a little bit of thinking about how much of that business do you want? What's your ROI? How do you invest in that? And so it's all evolving. And, and just like with cookies, as we're talking about, with those partners, it's changing literally every three months, what they're offering, how you can partner, how you can market, what data is available. Um, so hopefully in a future state, we'll be able to get all that. But you know, in the restaurant space, we're all uh, kind of playing a little bit of this game back and forth with them a little right now. Okay. 
So Karen, uh, you're, you're yeah. in, in market, people own the data. How, how is this applicable to you? Well, I think actually we have a huge advantage being a destination marketing organization because, uh, again, our partners are paying us dues to be a part of our organization, and we already have a symbiotic relationship with them, right? We're doing a lot to drive demand for the entire area, um, and then they're picking up the baton and, and taking it home to their hotel, their restaurant, their golf course, their attraction, uh, their retail store. And so we're already in relationship with them and doing things, as Lucky can attest, um, our team is, it, we're already doing things in which um, they trust us. So they're actually sharing anonymized data back to us so that we can be building great personas and we can really understand who's coming to the destination in July versus who's coming in October. And, you know, so that we can continue to refine our marketing. So they rely on us for a lot of things, but we rely on them also for what they can share with us. Um, you know, in this kind of system. So it's not as competitive um, because we're all in the ecosystem trying to make Myrtle Beach, um, you know, uh, more successful than Daytona Beach or Virginia Beach or, or some other place. So um, I think that that is an advantage, but, um, you know, that has been challenging as we've been doing uh, a, some data projects together just in the last year, um, uh, signing on um, some new, um, technology partners so that we can track, uh, for instance, you know, occup occupancy and ADR, there's been the trust issue, there's been the privacy issue um, between partners, right, um, and getting people over the hurdle so that then we can work together um, and get some information and data back from them that will make us do a better job or help us do a better job on their behalf. So it's a, a little bit different, I think, uh, in that DMO space, um, but clearly our partners are dealing with the very same thing that Alan's talking about, if they're a Marriott, if they're a, you know, a, a, a church's chicken, it, you know, whoever they are in our system and they're part of us, they are having to deal with, um, you know, the, the specifics of who owns that, that last <laughs> quarter mile <laughs> to yeah. the door, right, um, yeah. in terms of delivery services. So um, it, it, it's definitely challenging, um, but again, it's about going back to something really old fashioned in marketing, which is relationship building and, and creating that trust and understanding about um, how we are codependent. And if we work well together, um, we can lift everybody's profit margins uh, doing it that way. But um, it, it's definitely kind of um, uh, a, a new way for us to be thinking about it. Great. Okay, so I've got a couple and I know we've got about five minutes. So I want to kind of rapid fire. Um, and this is a um, an interesting question for this panel. Um, and I, I think what this, this question is about B2B um, and sales. So put a different hat, a consultative hat on for, uh, uh, for Shannon who asked this question is, what advice do you have for marketers and B2B sales driven organizations uh, to set expectations for their leadership based on the likelihood of leads dropping for everyone? Um, you know, I, I can only imagine if we're, you're dependent on that constant lead flow uh, how that would how that would look. So, Andrea, do you have any thoughts uh, on the B two B side and how we love reset expectation for our sales management and our upper management? Um, so we are making sure we're currently communicating with upper management for expectations. Right, this is a change. This is not a change that we are imposing ourselves directly. The industry as a whole is setting this on us. So. Um, clear, honest facts to um, our upper management we have been providing on a regular basis. Um, but also, I would suggest looking at new ways, um, turn your chair around to the table and look at it differently and find out different opportunities where you could potentially um, get additional leads, partner with someone who then maybe can do some webinars or, or something similar to this to help educate people. But then that also gives you leads, right? It's a lead generation tool to help you find new ways. Um, again, it's that kind of that progressive profiling that you can get where people will give ad, you know, email addresses or contact information to you um, so that you can then help reach back out to them because there's a heavy intent, in my opinion, um, if someone is willing to give you that information and come and learn about some information, they trust you, you potentially have information that they are looking to get, and then that's a way that they can help you um, build partnerships, relationships, and potentially get additional leads. Great. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on uh, the B2B question? 
I, I just agree with Andrea. I think that and one of the things that we found to be really successful in the last couple of years is, is again, co-branding opportunities where we can get to uh, brands that uh, really have a great fit and again, are going after the same target profile and find ways to work together and generate some, some new leads. And I guess the last thing I would just say too is in setting those expectations for upper management, it's it's not always about quantity. It is about quality. I know that sounds again really, really trite, but um, again, you know, judge us on you know our throughput and what we're able to achieve, um, and not just looking at sort of uh, you know a, a number and saying, oh my gosh, you know, your lead flow is is dropped fifteen percent. You're not doing something well. Um, so you know, I think Andrew is right. Saying that up front and setting those clear, honest expectations is going to be very wise for people to do. Uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, Tunde, anything you'd like to add to that one? No, I think, um, you know, Cameron and Andrea answered it perfectly. Perfect. All right, this is a great question uh, from uh, an anonymous attendee. Um, with cookies depreciating over time, how important would you say branding is for an overall business and marketing strategy? Uh, Alan, you want to kick us off? I think it's, it's super important probably getting more and more important, uh, especially as we start to shift to more contextual marketing. And so, I, you know, I think there's a re-emphasis on understanding your brand and, and what it means and, and how that brand communicates to that need for, you know, for your target. Great. Andrea? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think branding is going to come have, have a swing back to becoming even more relevant um, to kind of play off of what Karen spoke about in a previous comment about that trust. That brand is recognized and it builds that trust, which trust, I believe, is, is everything, especially as we're talking about the digital space, right? If you can build that trust, then they're going to come to you and look to you. Um, and they can also be referrals. So it's another lead build on top of that, that by having that quality brand um, that is portrayed over and over again and recognizable, it's going to build that trust and, and help generate sales and leads. And Karen. Well, despite starting in direct marketing, I, I'll have to sort of betray my, my true love, which is being a classical brand marketer. Uh, to me, brand is king. Brand is everything. I mean, we can have the best digital strategies. We can have um, so many great data solutions. We can have the best uh, agency partners. But if our brand is tarnished, if our brand is not growing, if it's not improving, it's not building that trust, then you, you don't have much. So um, I would say brand remains king. And we just have to keep making sure we're investing in it. Um, and paying attention and continue to evolve what our brand means to our customers. That, that, that never stops, ever, ever, ever. That's awesome. Okay, so the last question, really, um, I think it's a, a really uh, good one. Take off your business hat and put on you as a consumer. What do you think about these changes? Tune day. I think it's great, actually. I feel like as a consumer, um, I have some level of control. Um, I feel like I can decide what I want to receive, what I want to hear, and I can really show my love for my brands that I actually like. Um, and I get stalked across the internet for brands that I don't like. So I think as a consumer, I'm very happy about it and I can get more relevant communications. Andrea? Uh, I couldn't agree more. I, I definitely think it, it's, it's needed. Um, you know, some of the targeting because I've been out on a site looking at something and then my daughter goes on it because my IP is being targeted and she's, you know, seeing places I've gone to buy Christmas presents for her and stuff like <laughs> that. You know, it, it, it kind of, it kind of gives that ownership, like Tunde said, back to me, but it also, it helps kind of maybe put some controls in place so it's not over inundating because it's kind of gotten to that way I think a little bit with all the devices and all the technology and all the ways you're tracking people, um, you know, Things like Amazon put in place where Alexa won't tell you what was delivered in a package at Christmas time. It's kind of how do we do that in the digital world too? And, and we've kind of got nothing a little overboard as from a right. consumer perspective. Karen, then Alan will bring us home. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting the unmute button off. Um, I just agree. I just think this is about bringing balance back into that equation. And I think, um, again, um, our guests, our customers are going to appreciate that we are respecting their privacy. And that's, again, another part of the brand promise is respecting your customer. So I think it's a good thing. And Alan? I agree 100%. I think it's all about trust and 
that Karen hit on it earlier around you having that trust with the brands that, that you like or that you love. Uh, and it's an opportunity for you to feel very comfortable with your, your data and, and what level of privacy you want to have. And so from a consumer perspective, I think it's a total win. Outstanding. Well, I cannot thank you for enough amazing content. We could probably keep going. If I were in the audience, you would get a standing ovation. Uh, I would encourage anybody that has follow on, reach out to uh, me or Courtney and we'll get you connected. Uh, there are several questions in queue. We'll try to get going, but thank you so much. And Courtney, I'll send it back to you. Great. Thanks, John. I just want to say thank you so much for sponsoring um, this event. I think it was a great discussion. It was great to see some new faces and some old faces, people I've worked with for a long time. So um, if anybody um, is interested in sponsoring an event like this, please reach out to either myself or Guy or find us online. And we'd love to talk with you about a sponsorship opportunity. And we hope that you all will join another event virtually and fingers crossed we'll all be together again soon in person. Well, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Hi, yes, thank you. Take care.